And welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I want to examine the physics of car crashes. We're going to look at some of the important physical principles involved with a car colliding with a brick wall. But before I go on, I want to add a little caveat. And that is, I'm going to be talking about it from a high school perspective. So I'm going to talk about impulse, momentum, kinetic energy, and so forth. But I'm going to deal it in a simplistic way. Now, if you were to go to university and, and study mechanics, and particularly in terms of car collisions, you'll note that actually the detail of physics within car crashes and hence in increasing safety of cars is actually quite complex. So I'm going to deal it at a fairly simplistic level. And the whole purpose is, is to give you a better understanding of some important concepts rather than going into the fine detail of all the physics principles covered in a car collision. So the video that I'm going to be referring to is this video here from Crash Lab in Victoria, where we examine a test collision of a car, uh, in this case a Commodore, at two speeds. So we've got here a car colliding here at 60 kilometers an hour. And as you can see, it crumples, and we're going to examine the effect of that crumpling. And then we also got a collision here at 100 kilometers an hour. And as you can see, it crashes into a wall, and you can see there's significantly more damage in this car. And again, we're going to look at what the principles are, and we'll see how increases in speed have a drastic change in forces involved in a car collision. So let's examine the details of them. And so first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to examine all the physics principles in terms of a car traveling at 60 kilometers an hour. And the car that we're first of all going to be using here is a Commodore. And the first thing we need to know, first of all, is that the mass of the Commodore varies a little bit, but generally speaking, it's around 1,550 kilograms, just over 1.5 metric ton. So that's what we're going to be using in our example of this car. Secondly, the thing important too is that although the speed is at 60 kilometers an hour, we need to stick in SI units. So understand that 60 kilometers an hour is equivalent to 16.67 meters per second. And so we're going to be referring to that. So let's talk about the principles. And the first thing I want to talk about is about Newton's three laws. I just want to talk about the fact that A, if a car crashes against a wall, then the car is applying a force onto the wall, and that clearly is in that direction. But the car, of course, also experiences a force, and that is because the wall applies an equal and opposite force, and that is the forces we're going to be interested in because that's going to actually impact what happens to the car. But that's Newton's third law. Secondly, of course, we're going to be understanding Newton's second law, which is summarized by that the net forces is equal to the mass times acceleration. Or the other way I like to think about it is that the acceleration is determined by the net force and the mass of the object. Well, you're going to see that the force that the car experiences it causes it to stop. Well, that means the car is slowing down. And of course, that means it's, it's accelerating. And it's accelerating, of course, in that direction. And that force will determine the rate of acceleration. But the other factor, of course, is, is the mass of the car, which is the 1,550 kilograms. We might also talk about uh, inertia and the concept that an object will continue at rest or constant velocity unless acted on by external force. And so one of the things you can see is that when the car collides, the passenger keeps on going because the fact is the force is applied to the car initially and the, not on the passenger. So the passenger just continues to move at 60 kilometers an hour until such time it experiences a force. And in this case, that force is going to be applied by the airbag, which deploys at the collision. You can see it deployed just there. So that's basically Newton's law. But I want to talk now also about some other concepts. And I want to talk about kinetic energy. And you know that kinetic energy is determined simply by a half multiplied by the mass and multiplied by the velocity squared. The velocity has a square relationship with the kinetic energy. 
And so what we can do is work out what is the kinetic energy of the car. And the kinetic energy of the car prior to the collision is simply this half multiplied by our 1550 multiplied by the velocity, which is 16.67 squared. So, and that gives us a total of, and I've put it in scientific notation, of 2.1536 times 10 to the power of five joules. So that is the amount of kinetic energy that this car has. Now, of of course, the car's kinetic energy drops down to zero once it stops, so that there is a change in kinetic energy. And of course, that change in kinetic energy, since it stops, is also equal to uh, that value, which is 2.1536 by 10 to the power of 5 joules. Now, that's not an increase in kinetic energy, that is a decrease in kinetic energy, so we put that negative. Now, kinetic energy is not a, a vector quantity, but that negative means that there's a loss of kinetic energy, and then we'll talk about that, how that is important. So, that's the first thing, there's a drop in kinetic energy. Now, what causes a kinetic energy to change? And the really important to understand is, is that that means work is done. And work causes a change in kinetic energy, and it also can cause, though not in this case, a change in gravitational potential energy, though it could also be both. So we're interested in the change in kinetic energy. But what is work? Work is when a force is applied, and that force is applied multiply the certain displacement that this occurs. And so we can now work out what the force is that is applied here if we know how much the displacement takes place. Now for the sake of simplicity, the displacement that we're going to use is one meter. So it isn't exactly one meter, and as we'll do in the second uh, scenario where we've got 100 kilometers an hour, we're going to keep it at one meter, even though chances are it actually changes a little. I'm doing this for simplicity's sake, not necessarily to be completely accurate. But let's have a look at that. So uh, if you can see that, that if the work done is the change in kinetic energy, then the force multiplied by the displacement, which is one meter, that is equal to our 2.1536 by 10 to the power of 5 joules. And therefore you can see, and now it's negative because the force is going to be applied in the opposite direction of the velocity. And so you can see that the force therefore will be equal to negative 2.1536 by 10 to the power of 5 newtons. Okay, so in other words, the force that is being applied that causes this car traveling at 60 kilometers an hour to go from that speed down to zero is this value. So if we do that, you're looking at 215,000 newtons. That's quite high. Now, I will make a point here. This value of the force is an average force. The reality is, is the crumple zone acts also a bit like a spring and springs change their forces depending on how much compression takes place. So this value isn't completely accurate throughout the whole collision. Chances are it fluctuates. So this is maybe a good average, but it isn't necessarily the value through the whole time of the compression. So anyway, that gives us the force. Now what I would like to do is understand that this particular force, how can we determine how long it takes for this collision to take place? Well, now we have a second principle. So here this is all about work and kinetic energy. And now we're going to talk about the change in momentum. And change in momentum is often referred to as impulse. And the change in momentum is equal to the force multiplied by the time that that force is applied. And this is simply just an extension of Newton's third law. I won't go into that into detail right now, but generally speaking, this can be determined, this formula, by understanding what Newton's third law is. That means this force is that force down there. So and we already know the mass of the car and we already know the velocity. And so what we end up getting is this. We have our change in momentum. Now remember our momentum is zero when it finishes. So our actual momentum or our impulse is equal to 16.67, there's our velocity, multiplied by the mass of the car, which is 1550. That is caused 
due to a force, and that force is down here, which is just 2.1536, multiplied by 10 to the power of 5, negative, and of course, this is also a change in momentum, so that can be negative as well, multiplied by the time that this force is applied. And so when we rearrange this, we get a time of 0 0.12 seconds. So there we have it. There's our situation with a car traveling at 60 kilometers an hour. So now let's look at the car traveling at 100 kilometers an hour. And clearly there's a lot more damage here. Well, let's explore why that is the case. First of all, what we need to do is to understand that 100 kilometers an hour is not an SI unit, and that is equal to 27.78 meters per second. Where we already have our mass, it hasn't changed, it's 1550 kilograms. So let's talk about the loss in kinetic energy. The change in kinetic energy must equal to the force multiplied by the displacement. So the change in kinetic energy now is a half multiplied by the mass, which is 1550 multiplied by the velocity squared, 27.78, and we square that. That is the kinetic energy in this case, and that gives us a grand total of 5.981 by 10 to the power of 5. Now, that, of course, is in joules. What is the average force? Well, again, assuming that the displacement is exactly the same, so in this case, 1, uh, though it is clearly is a little bit increased here, but just for the simplicity's sake, we're going to leave it as one. You can see that is going to equal to this change in kinetic energy in 5.819 times 10 to the power of five. And that gives us a force of 5.981 multiplied by 10 to the power of five newtons. So that's the average force exerted on the car. Now you can see it's significantly bigger. What about the impulse? Well, change in momentum is equal to, in this case, Ft. If we, then we, if we substitute everything in, we get 1550 multiplied by 27.78, and that is equal to F multiplied by T. Since this value here is not, uh, we can calculate, and this F is here, so that is equal to 5. 981 by 10 to the power of 5 multiplied by t, we can now rearrange this and that gives us a time of 0 0.072 seconds. So this is significantly smaller than our previous time that we had before. So now let's compare the two scenarios. So first of all, let's have a look at velocity. Our velocity in this case was 16.67 meters per second. Our velocity in this case was 27.78 meters per second. And so that is an increase of 1.67 increase in velocity. If we now look at our kinetic energy, we can see that our kinetic energy from our previous example was 2.15 by 10 to the power of 5 joules. In the 100 kilometer example a case, it was 5.981 by 10 to the power of 5 joules. Now that is an increase of not 1.67, but 2.7. Now if you were to do your calculation, that kinetic energy increase here, this is a squared relationship. 1.67 times itself is equal to 2.7. So any increase in speed causes an, a square increase in its kinetic energy. So if you double your speed, your kinetic energy goes up by a factor of four. So if you triple your speed, your kinetic energy clearly goes up by a factor of nine. Now, the fact is, if the crumple zones are assumed to be roughly the same, then the forces were, if you remember, exactly the same number. So in this case of 60 kilometers an hour, it was 2.15. In this case, it was 5.981 by 10 to the power of five newtons. Again, that is an increase of 2.7. So the forces increase again by a square of the velocity increase. 
And so that is really significant as well. Now that we have the force and we have the mass, we can work out what the actual acceleration is of our two situations. The acceleration in this case is negative 138.9 meters per second squared. The acceleration over here was equal to negative 385 meters per second squared. Now, as you can see, there is a significant increase. If we then look at the g-forces, which is the value given to the number of factors of increasing of your weight, so one g-force is equating your, um, your current weight, two g-forces is twice that, and so forth, you can see that you experience about 14.2 g-forces in this situation, whereas here you're experiencing around 39 g-forces in this situation. So what does this tell us? Well, if you increase your speed, then the forces increase significantly by square. Your deceleration or your negative acceleration increases also. All in all, what it means is less likely to survive. Now, people generally tend to survive experiencing forces of around 14.2 g-forces people tend to not survive 39 g-forces. Now, there have been tests on Formula One drivers that have been experiencing for a short duration much higher g-forces, but please understand this is simplistic mathematics. Generally speaking, when a car collides here, yes, there is a force here, but we're attributing this force on average across the whole body. You're experiencing those forces concentrated either on the head or on the parts where the seatbelt is placed on your body. And so the pressure on your body is actually significantly larger if because it's not evenly spread out. And so therefore that causes massive internal uh, damage. And uh, hence, of course, that is going to possibly be fatal. The other thing too is, is that when a car crashes like this, you need to understand there are parts of the cabin, although this part here is designed to be fairly rigid in order to absorb as much energy as possible, protect the occupants. Nonetheless, there'll be parts, plastics will be flying around and they themselves, of course, can also do damage. Needless to say, traveling at 100 kilometers an hour and crashing has a much lower uh, chance of survival than traveling at 60 kilometers an hour. The point here finally is, is this, that everything that happens with a car is governed by physics laws. Newton's three laws and understanding of kinetic energy, work, impulse, and change in momentum. Well, that summarizes that. If you have any comments, please uh, put them down below. Again, as I said to you, uh, all of this is simple physics in order to just get a, a grasp of the concepts involved. So if you are a mechanical engineer, I'm sure you can add some extra details for interest's sake, but hopefully uh, for those who are studying physics, this gives you a better handle of Newton's laws and the laws in, in mechanics. Thanks for watching, bye for now. I hope you found that video useful. And remember, like, share and subscribe. Oh, and if you have a comment or a question, or you'd like a concept for me to explain to you, please drop a comment down below. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.